Julian, Katie, it's great to have you here. We've just listened to that interview from Peter Tatchell. I mean, what I thought was quite interesting listening to Peter was that he was in full agreement that this person should not have been in a woman's prison. And also, it was interesting to hear him say at the end of that conversation that he thinks there are differences between biological sex and um, gender. Julie Bindler, I'll come to you first for your reaction to Peter's interview. First of all, I have to tell you that I'm very angry listening to what Peter Tatchell said. First of all, he uses the term other women. And although he obviously virtue signals about the fact that this male rapist may be disingenuous, may be an opportunist, doesn't know whether he's a true trans, and that definitely is coming uh, from, from Tatchell loud and clear. He still actually uses the term she for this person who is clearly an opportunist and says that whatever sex, and this is Tatchell saying it, whatever sex a rapist is, they're still a rapist. Well, that's not actually true because rape is a gendered, a sexed crime. It can only be committed by a person with a penis, which is male, it's a man. And when Tatchell also talks about not having dangerous rapists or just rapists amongst other women, as he says, he also drops in the term free association, meaning, of course, perhaps they should be segregated. So he's saying three things. He's saying other women, meaning that this rapist is, as far as he's concerned, a woman. He's saying that whatever sex anyone is that rapes, then they should be kept away from others, from, from women. In other words, both women and men can rape, which isn't the case. And he's also saying that if there is a dangerous uh, fox amongst uh, the chickens, then they should be in segregation. No, these men should not be in the women's estate. There should be a separate wing for trans identified prisoners in the men's prison not the women's estate. Straightforward, simple as that. No amount of verbal word salad and gymnastics from Tatchell and his cohorts will make any difference. Okay. Um, Haiti, what, what what was your reaction to, to, to what um, Peter said? I mean, it is also interesting. He, Peter did say that, you know, one of the options could be specific wings for transgender um prisoners but but Katie what's your assessment of what Peter said and sort of where we are with this story about Isla Bryson well two things I think there was a, a, a righteous and right outcry about Bryson I'm glad they've now been moved back to sort of Edinburgh male prison um and I'm not kind of arguing that on the basis of that there are true trans and and good trans and different trans and that just the ones who are sex offenders shouldn't be moved I think the argument has to be had um, I find it interesting that I probably sit somewhere between Julie and Peter, whereas people probably assume I might be on the further side beyond Peter, advocating 110% for trans rights without question. What I regard ask for is trans rights with question. I think everything has to be questioned. These are these are difficult situations. Um, but I think what is interesting is that the, the England and Wales already have a transgender wing for um, violent offenders. People might argue it's in the wrong prison and it should be actually part of the male estate rather than actually part of a segregated wing of a female estate. But it is progress in the sense that it is called it is creating separation. I do believe that we have treated Peter also made that point, actually, about the fact that we don't assume that all Muslims are terrorists in the same way we shouldn't assume that all trans are sex offenders. However, if you then put that into the prison context, we do assume that all terrorists are at risk of radicalizing others. So all sex offenders, if they are trans or otherwise, are at risk of harming women. So I think there should be an absolute blanket ban on sex offenders, regardless from being even being considered for pushing over to the female wing. And there is an argument for putting all sex offenders in a separate wing, full stop. And it should be part of the male estate, I would argue. And the same way that we also protect people who commit other sex offences, but we actually protect them for their own, from their own self, from other prisoners, in the sense that we put paedophiles in uh, in watch wings, suicide people watch wings. We have a lot of systems within the prison service to utilise, but I think there's been some very bad decision making. People trying to be good allies, but not thinking clearly and putting allyship ahead of risk assessment. And I think that is always the case. And I think it's interesting as well, because Peter's trying to be a good ally. Because I've had conversations with Peter stretching back a number of years, you know, taking him on in, in actual kind of debates in the past where he was critical of trans. 
And I would say he's actually now more pro-trans than me. And I do sense, even in that interview you've done with him, that he is shifting back a bit. So I would say the conversation's heading in the right direction, but we haven't arrived at anywhere that is both safe for everyone and particularly for women who have a disproportionate likelihood of having been victims. Yeah. And it strikes me that we have got to a place and it shouldn't have taken us this long to to come to this place where you have to have, I think we'd all be agreed, we might have slightly different views on this, you have to have compassion, but you have to have common sense as well. And Julie, one of the things that I've been quite struck by, and of course I was part of the team that drafted the Equality Act that is now, of course, right at, at the heart of, of all of this when I was working for Harriet Harman, MP, but... One of the things I was talking to somebody quite, quite senior who had worked within the justice system is that they were saying it's really clear that no individual, whether they're a man or, or a woman, however they identify, has got the right to sort of choose which prison they, they go into. That is down to the prison authorities to make a case by case risk assessment. They have a duty to contain prisoners safely and within the law and, of course, within sort of human rights. But it feels like the prison services have somehow got very scared or they're trying with good intentions to be allies, but the result of it is like the worst unintended consequences. I mean, what do you think is going on, Julie, here? Well, I hear from female prisoners constantly. And in fact, I hear from people that have worked within the prison system. I'm a feminist law reform campaigner. I would empty the prisons of most uh, people in prison, um, uh, except for those that pose a danger to others and that means the vast majority of women and many of the men so that is simple uh, simple fact i have campaigned for an end to male prison officers in women's prisons way before the trans issue came up i think what's happening and this is what women tell me both inmates and uh, probation staff and the like is that they are terrified of being labeled transphobic i get emails from prison staff with pronouns in their email sign off um, there is trans ideology that dominates over women's safety. And actually, this has never been about keeping trans women out of single sex spaces. It's about keeping men out of single sex spaces. Trans women are men. And therefore, we have to do what we did decades ago, which is build single sex spaces. We have to have the legislation that allows us to do that. We have to maintain our right in law and in policy to have single sex spaces. And when Peter says Muslim people are seen to be terrorists, so therefore, you know, we say that all Muslims are dangerous, this is outrageous, there's a tiny, tiny proportion of them. Well, actually, when we set up single sex spaces, we didn't have to argue that most men are rapists. We never had to argue, and nor did we ever say that most men pose a danger to women. We said enough of them do that we have to have single spec, say, single areas for women and that we have to respect that because there is a safeguarding issue so it's nonsense this idea that you can play russian roulette with a nice genuine trans person in a woman's prison and somebody who's a nasty piece of work who isn't really a trans person how on earth are we supposed to find that out how on earth are those women in prison that i talk to regularly who are terrified just at the sight of of an obvious man claiming to be a trans woman on the wing. How do we cope with their fear when they know that they won't be protected by the majority of prison officers because they will be accused of transphobia? I mean, Katie, there's a lot in that. What's your response to, to that? And what is the way forward? Because as you rightly said, and as Peter said, you know, we don't want a situation where all trans people are being vilified and I think there is a particularly understandably because of the story and, and lots of other things there is a I think a rise in climate of hostility against trans people but there are people who are clearly gaming the system for very bad motives like Isla uh, Bryson what's the solution what is the what is the humane um but not naive solution here Katie well, I think there is a degree to which people are gaming the system, but that's, you know, because the number of trans prisoners in, in England and Wales has pretty much doubled again. So I think that was always going to be a risk. But uh, I think actually we have to come back to what Julie said. And, and you know, it should be, is a question. There should be no trans prisoners in a female jail. But where does that mean trans prisoners should be? 
is there to be a third estate? Now, I think some of this is we've we've created a rod for our own back with the laws we've created ever since 2004 on the GRA anyway. And by actually creating the, the gender equals sex identity kind of equation, we, we've, we've, we've made this happen. And interestingly enough, the act that we should be using more is the Equality Act, which distinguishes between sex and gender and actually allows for reasonable exemptions which should be applied more often there's an element of reasonableness and an element of compassion that should definitely be applied in all these situations but if we were to start the whole argument all over again we'll say we're back in the early 2000s how do we accommodate trans people in society because i don't think anyone if on a good day is actually saying erase trans people and i don't think anyone is really saying from the trans side erase erase women and, and kate on that Julie, let's just, there are some people who will argue that there are some women on the gender critical side who who just do not like trans people. They don't like the existence of trans people. They think there's too many of them. They think they should be a rolling back on rights. There should be a reduction. What, where do you stand on that? Give, give us your side on that. Well, I've never referred to myself as gender critical. I'm a gender abolitionist. It would be like being critical of racism or cancer. So <clears throat> I think it's something that feminists have always problematized we've always looked at the kind of gender roles as being punishing for women and, and beneficial to men if there are those that are bigots against trans people they're they're often and almost always bigots against lesbians and i'm a lesbian against gay men and other minoritized groups so that i hold no truck with them my position on this is very straightforward i've been campaigning to end men's violence towards women and girls for more than four decades it's only my business and my problem and my concern because there is a clash. I don't care what the likes of Peter Tatchell says. It's not about trans rights and women's rights when it comes to demands to enter single sex spaces. There is a clash during which women will lose and be in danger. So therefore I fight to keep single sex spaces and that's why I am against self-identification and the inclusion of men who identify as trans in single sex spaces just because of the risk of men's violence, no other reason. I think and what just, we've got to do, though, is to actually set, work sorry, out Katie, what just, does self-ID mean, sorry. Yeah, and just before that, I just because, Katie, you did mention the Equality Act, and I just think for, for mm. listeners, who because, look, this is all quite complicated. There's lots of different bits of legislation and proposed legislation flying around. The Equality Act, and I know this will help write this, but like the, the Equality Act does, does protect trans people, but it does allow for discrimination on mm. reasonable grounds to protect women in single sex spaces and it can be used for somebody who has what's known as a grc which is a gender recognition certificate and it is actually if you speak to a lot of you know women's groups like women's aid and and others they are kind of navigating this you know in a real life way on quite a practical level but of course we now have you know new legislation tensions are running really high and katie look I suppose as well from, from your position as a trans woman and you ha- you talk about this a lot and you're very moderate in many ways. But just explain to my listeners, Julie's made a very strong case about, you know, what what she wants to argue for. What do you think would help make life easier for, for trans people and better for trans people? Because I think trans people are having quite a hard time at the moment. Yeah. And it, and it's and it's a, a quite a vicious atmosphere out there. And I both sides on that sense and so I'm not going to like uh, put my hand up and deny that trans people haven't been quite violent in their language back in this whole kind of uh, um, war uh, on both sides as it's regarded as an article just come out by a socialist work I think it's on about the war on trans people but we've also heard about the war on women and this war language is the war footing we're on and, and, and when you're on a war footing everyone is on edge and we've got, I think I said, we do have to create a space for trans people in society that isn't necessarily always in women's spaces. And this is completely ignoring temporarily trans men. Um, and, I, and I think we've got to recognize that we need a space in society for everyone to coexist. And sometimes there are going to be spaces where they can be together. And sometimes there is the argument and the law allows for it for separation. Now, it's quite possible to have women's plus spaces and women only spaces just with a nuanced change in language there are some organizations that do welcome trans into those spaces some that welcome trans and non-binary which is always going to be the third space aspect and i think we probably do have to revisit the third space angle we have like ever since although it was 2009 odd pakistan became the first country to add a third gender marker to passports there are now a dozen that accept that 
go back all the way to 1904, 1906, Magnus Hirschfeld wrote his book called The Third Sex, and he used the language, the third sex, to describe all what we would now call LGBTI people existing out the, outside the then heterosexual binary culture. So I think we need to look, what does a third space look like and what do inclusive spaces look like and what do exclusive spaces look like? And let's have all of them, but let's identify them and let's let the people inside those spaces define them rather than the people outside define them and demanding entry. Anyone who's demanding entry in my point of view is someone who's lacking empathy to the people inside that space. And there's a biggest issue for me is there's a lack of empathy on both sides at the moment because we're on this war footing. And if we can get back to the conversation about how to create a better space for all, which is an original feminist argument anyway, creating a bigger cake rather than sharing out a smaller cake. Okay, and we're just running out of time. Um... I just wanted to put to you as well, just I suppose that uh, we, we're talking a lot about, um, uh, you know, the, the the prison system at the moment. And, and I think there's actually quite a lot of agreement about what a terrible decision this was. Um, Julie, final word to you. I mean, how do you think we we move this on? I mean, I'm not naive to think we can all have a kumbaya moment, but how 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 do you think we can, can move things? Because look. I'm sure you're exhausted by this. I'm sure Katie's, I mean, I think we're all quite, I mean, it's it's been a pretty difficult, exhausting, everyone's emotionally strung out. Where does this go, Julie? Where would you like this to go? I would like there to be a space in the men's estate for trans-identified males. I would like women-only spaces to be maintained in law and in policy. And I would like the recognition that if a male person has been socialised as male and then identifies as a trans woman, they are still male and they are still as much of a danger and a threat to women as other men. We mustn't be naive about this. I think that trans identified women should be in the male estate and they, like gay men, like disabled men, like weaker men, should be protected from the bullies and we should have an anti-rape, anti-bullying strategy in men's prisons and they should accommodate trans women. 